Troll Slayer, a God Track and Felix novel by William King. Geheimnisnacht. After the terrible events and nightmares adventures we endured in Altorf, my companion and I fled southwards, following no paths more certain than the chosen for us by blind chance. We took whatever means of transport presented itself stagecoach, peasant cart, dryage wagon, resorting to our own two feet when all else failed. It was a difficult and fear filled time for me. At every turning it seemed we stood in imminent danger of arrest and either imprisonment or execution. I saw sheriffs in every tavern and bounty killers behind every bush. If the troll slayer suspected that anything might have been otherwise, he never bothered to communicate this information to me. To one as ignorant of the true state of our legal system as I then was, it seemed all too possible that the entire apparatus of our mighty and extensive state might be bent to the apprehension of two fugitives such as ourselves. I did not then have any idea of quite how feeble and randomly the rule of law was applied. It was indeed a pity that all those sheriffs and all those bounty killers who peopled my imagination did not, in fact, exist, for perhaps then evil would not have flourished quite so strongly within the boundaries of my homeland. The extent and nature of the evil was to become very clear to me one dark evening after boarding southbound stagecoach on what is perhaps the most ill-omened night in our entire calendar. From My Travels with Gottrek, Volume 2, Herr Felix Jäger, Altdorf Press 2505. Damn all manling coach drivers and all manling women, Gottrek Gernison mumbled, adding a cross and dwarvish. You did have to insult the lady assault, didn't you? Felix Jäger said peevishly. As things are, we are lucky they didn't just shoot us, if you can call it lucky to be dumped in the Reichwald on Geheimnisnacht Eve. We paid for our passage. We were just as entitled to sit inside as her. The drivers were unmanly cowards, Gottrek grumbled. They refused to meet me hand to hand. I would not have minded being spitted on steel, but being blasted with buckshot is no death for a troll slayer. Felix shook his hand. He could see that one of his companion's black moods was coming on. There would be no arguing with him and Felix had plenty of other things to worry about. The sun was sitting, giving the mist-covered forest a ruddy hue. Long shadows danced eerily and brought to mind too many frightening tales of horrors to be found under the canopy of trees. He wiped his nose with the edge of his cloak, then pulled the Sutherland wool tight about him. He sniffed and looked at the sky, where more sleep and monsleep, the lesser and greater moons, were already visible. More sleep seems to be giving off a faint greenish glow. Wasn't a good sign. I think I have a fever coming on, Felix said. The troll slayer looked up at him and chuckled contemptuously. In the last rays of the dying sun, his nose chain was a bloody arc running from nostril to earlobe. Yours is a weak race, Godrek said. The only fever I feel this eve is a battle fever. It sings in my head. He turned and glared out into the darkness of the woods. Come out, little beast man, he bellowed. I have a gift for you. He laughed loudly and ran his thumb along the edge of the blade of this great two-handed axe. Felix saw that it drew blood. Gottrek began to suck a thumb. Sigma preserve us. Be quiet, Felix hissed. Who knows what lurks out there on a night like this? Gottrek glared at him. Felix could see the glint of insane violence appear in his eyes. Instinctively, Felix's hand strayed nearer to the pommel of his sword. Give me no orders, manling. I am of the elder race, and beholden only to the kings under the mountain, exiled though I be. Felix bowed formally. He was well schooled in the use of the sword. The scars on his face showed that he had fought several duels in his student days. 
He had once killed a man and so ended a promising academic career. But still, he did not relish the thought of fighting the troll slayer. The tip of Gotrek's crested hair came only to the level of Felix's chest, but the dwarf outwited him and his bulk was all muscle. And Felix had seen Gotrek use that axe. The dwarf took the bow as an apology and turned once more to the darkness. Come out! Come out! he shouted. I care not if all the powers of evil awake the woods this night. I will face any challenger. The dwarf was working himself up to a pitch of fury. During the time of his acquaintances, Felix had noticed that the troll slayer's long periods of brooding were often followed by brief explosions of rage. It was one of the things about his companions that fascinated Felix. He knew that Godric had become a troll slayer to atone for some crime. He was sworn to seek death in unequal combat with fearsome monsters. He seemed bitter to the point of madness, yet he kept to his oath. Perhaps, Felix thought, I too would go mad if I had been driven into exile among strangers, not even of my own race. He felt some sympathy for the crazed dwarf. Felix knew what it was like to be driven from home under a cloud. The duel with Wolfgang Krasner had caused quite a scandal. At the moment, however, the dwarf seemed bent on getting them both killed, and he wanted no part of it. Felix continued to plot along the road, casting an occasional worried glance in the bright full moon. Behind him the ranting continued. Are there no warriors among you? Come, feel my axe. She thirsts. Only a madman would so tempt fate and the dark powers on Geheimnisnacht, night of mystery of the darkest reaches of the forest, Felix decided. He could make out chanting in the flinty guttural tone of the mountain dwarf. Then, once more in Reichspiel, he heard, Send me a champion! For a second, there was silence. Condensation from the clammy mist ran down his brow. Then, from afar, far off, the sound of galloping horses rang out in the quiet night. What has that maniac done? Felix thought. Has he offended one of the old powers? Have they sent their demon riders to carry us off? Felix stepped off the road. He shuddered as wet leaves fondled his face. They felt like dead man's fingers. The thunder of hooves came closer, moving with hellish speed along the forest road. Surely only a supernatural being could keep such breakneck pace on the winding forest road? He felt his hand shake as he unsheathed his sword. It was foolish to follow Gotrek, he thought. Now I'll never get that poem finished. He could hear the loud neighing of horses, the crackling of a whip and mighty wheels turning. Good, Gotrek roared. His voice drifted from the trail behind. Good. There was a loud bellowing and four immense jet horses drawing an equally black coach hurtled past. Felix saw the wheels bounce as they hit the rut in the road. He could just make out a black-cloaked driver. He shrank back into the bushes. He heard the sound of feet coming closer. The bushes were pulled aside. Before him stood Gokrak, looking madder and wilder than ever. His crest was matted, brown mud was smeared over his tattooed body, and his studded leather jerkin was ripped and torn. The snotling fondlers try to run me over. Let's get after them. He turned and headed up the muddy road at a fast trot. Felix noted that Gotrek was singing happily in Kazalit. Further down the Bogenhafen road, the pair found the standing stones in. The windows were shuttered and no lights showed. They could hear a neighing from the stables, but when they checked there was no coach, black or otherwise. Only some skittish ponies and a peddler's cart. We have lost the coach. Might as well get a bed for the night, Felix suggested. He looked wearily at the smaller moon more sleep. The sickly green glow was stronger. I do not like being abroad under this evil light. You are feeble, manling. Cowardly, too. They'll have ale. 
On the other hand, some of your suggestions are not without merit. Watery though human beer is, of course. Of course, Felix said. Godric failed to spot the note of irony in his voice. The inn was not fortified, but the walls were thick, and when they tried the door they found it was barred. Godric began to bang it with the butt of his axe shaft. There was no response. I can smell humans within, Godric said. Felix wondered how he could smell anything over his own stench. Godric never washed, and his hair was matted with animal fat to keep his red-dyed crest in place. They will have locked themselves in. Nobody goes abroad on Geheimnisnacht, unless they're witches or demon lovers. The black coach was abroad, Gottrek said. Its occupants were up to no good. The windows were curtained and the coach bore no crest of arms. My throat is too dry to discuss such details. Come on, open up in there, or I'll take my axe to the door. Felix thought he heard movement within. He pressed an ear to the door. He could make out the mutter of voices and what sounded like weeping. Unless you want me to chop through your head, manling, I suggest you stand aside, Gottrek said to Felix. Just a moment. You, inside, open up. My friend has a very large axe and a very short temper. I suggest you do as he says or you lose your door. What was that about short? Gottrek said touchily. From behind the door came a thin, quavering cry. In the name of Sigma, be gone, you demons of the night. Right, that's it, Gottrek snapped. I've had enough. He drew his axe back in a huge arc. Felix saw the runes of its blade gleam in the more sleep light. He leapt aside. In the name of Sigma, Felix shouted, you cannot exorcise us. We are simple, very travelers. The axe bit into the door with a chunking sound. Splinters of wood flew from it. Gottrek turned to Felix and grinned evilly up at him. Felix noted the missing teeth. Shortly made these manling doors, Gottrek said. I suggest you open up while you still have a door, Felix called. Wait, the quavering voice said. That door cost me five crowns from Jürgen the carpenter. The door was unlatched. It opened. A tall, thin man with a sad face framed by lank white hair stood there. He had a stout club in one hand. Behind him stood an old woman who held a saucer and contained a guttering candle. You will not need your weapon, sir. We require only a bed for the night. And ale, the dwarf grunted. And ale, Felix said. Lots of ale, Gottrek said. Felix looked at the old man and shrugged helplessly. Inside the inn had a low common room. The bar was made of planks stretched across two barrels. From the corner, three armed men who looked like traveling peddlers watched them warily. Each had daggers drawn. The shadow hid their faces, but they seemed worried. The innkeeper hustled the pair inside and slid the bars back into place. Can you pay, Herr Doctor? He asked nervously. Felix could see the man's Adam apple moving. I'm not a professor. I'm a poet, he said, producing his sin pouch and counting out his few remaining gold coins. But I can pay. Food, Gottrek said. And ale. At this, the old woman burst into tears. Felix stared at her. The hag is discomforted, Gottrek said. The old man nodded. Our gunter is missing, of this of all nights. Get me some ale, Gottrek said. The innkeeper backed off. Gottrek got up and stumped over where the peddlers were sitting. They regarded him warily. Do any of you know about a black coach drawn by four black horses? Gottrek asked. You have seen the black coach? One of the peddlers asked. The fear was evident in his voice. Seen it? The bloody thing nearly ran me over, the man gasped. Felix heard the sound of a ladle being dropped. He saw the innkeeper stoop to pick it up and began refilling the trencard. You're lucky then, the fattest and most prosperous looking peddler said. Some say the coach is driven by demons. I have heard it passes here on Geheimnisnacht every year. 
Some say it carries wee children from Altdorf who are sacrificed at the Darkstone Ring. Gotrek looked at him with interest. Felix did not like the way this was developing. Surely that's only a legend, he said. No, sir, the innkeeper shouted. Every year we hear the thunder of its passing. Two years ago, Gunther looked out and saw it. A black coach, just as you describe. At the mention of Gunther's name, the old woman began to cry again. The innkeeper brought stew and two great steins of ale. Bring beer for my companion too, Gotrek said. The landlord went off for another stein. Who is Gunther? Felix asked when he returned. There was another wail from the old woman. More ale, Gotrek said. The landlord looked in astonishment at the empty flagons. Take mine, Felix said. Now, mine host, who is Gunther? And why does the old hack hold its very mention of his name? Gotrek asked, whipping his mouth on his mud-encrusted arm. Gunther is our son. He went out to chop wood this afternoon. He has not returned. No, no Gunther, Gunther is a good boy. The old woman sniffled. How will we survive without him? Perhaps he is simply lost in the woods. Impossible, the innkeeper says. Gunther knows the woods around here like I know the hair on my hand. He should have been home hours ago. I fear the coven has taken him as a sacrifice. It's like little Lotte Hauptmann's daughter, Ingrid, the fat peddler said. The innkeeper shot him a dirty look. I want no tales told of our son's betrothal, he said. Let the man speak, Gotrek said. The peddler looked at him gratefully. The same thing happened last year in Hatzroch, just down the road. Goodwife Hauptmann looked in on her teenage daughter Ingrid just after sunset. She thought she heard banging coming from her daughter's room. The girl was gone, snatched by who knows what sorcerous powers from her bed in the locked house. The next day the hue and cry went up. We found Ingrid. She was covered in bruises and in a terrible state. He looked at them to make sure he had their attention. You asked her what happened? Felix said. I, sir, it seems she had been carried off by demons, wild things, to the wood, to Darkstone Ring. There the coven waited with the evil creatures from the forest. They made sacrifice her by the altar, but she broke free from her captors and invoked the good name of Blessed Sigmar. While they reeled, she fled. They pursued but could not overtake her. That was lucky, Felix said dryly. There is no need to mock her, doctor. We made our way to the stones and we did find all sort of tracks in the disturbed earth including those of human and beasts and cloven-hoofed demons, and a yearling infant gutted like a pig upon the altar. Cloven-hoofed demons? Gotrek asked. Felix didn't like the look of interest in his eye. The peddler nodded. I would not venture up to Darkstone Ring tonight, the peddler said. Not for all the gold in Altdorf. Ah, it would be a task fit for a hero, Gotrek said, looking meaningful at Felix. Felix was shocked. Surely you cannot mean... What a better task for a troll slayer than to face these demons on their sacred night. It would be a mighty death. It would be a stupid death, Felix muttered. What was that? No, nothing. You're coming, aren't you? Gotrek said meaninglessly. He was rubbing his thumb along the blade of his axe. Felix noticed that it was bleeding again. He nodded slowly. An oath is an oath. The dwarf slapped him upon the back with such force that he thought his ribs would break. Sometimes, manling, I think you must have dwarf blood in you. Not that any of the elder race would stoop to such a mixed marriage, of course. He stomped back to his ale. Of course, his companion sat, glaring at his back. Felix rumbled in his pack for his mail shirt. He noticed that the innkeeper and his wife and the peddlers were looking at him. Their eyes held something that looked close to awe. 
Godrek sat near the fire, drinking ale and grumbling in dwarvish. You're not really going with him, the fat peddler whispered. Felix nodded. Why? He saved my life. I owe him a debt. Felix thought it best not to mention the circumstances under which Godrek had saved him. I pulled the manling out from under the hoofs of the Emperor's cavalry, Godrek shouted. <laughs> Felix cursed bitterly. The troll slayer has the hearing of a wild beast as well as the brains of one, he thought to himself, continuing to pull on the mail shirt. Aye, the manling thought it clever to put his case to the Emperor with petitions and protest marches. Old Karl Franz chose to respond, quite sensibly, with cavalry charges. The peddlers were starting to back away. An insurrectionist, Felix heard one mutter. Felix felt his face flush. It was yet another cruel and unjust tax. A silver piece for every window, indeed. To make it worse, all the fat merchants bricked up their window and the Altdorf militia went around knocking holes in the side of poor folks' hovels. We were right to speak out. There is a reward for the capture of insurgents, the peddler said. A big reward, Felix stared at him. Of course, the imperial cavalry were no match for my companion's axe, he said. Such carnage, heads, legs, arms, everywhere. He stood on a pile of bodies. They called for archers, Godric said. We departed down a back alley. Being splitted from afar would have been an unseemly death. The fat peddler looked at his companions, then at Godric, then at Felix, then back at his companions. A sensible man keeps out of politics, said to the man who had talked of rewards. He looked at Felix. No offense, sir. None taken. Felix said, you are absolutely correct. Insurrectionists are now, the old woman said. May Sigma bless you if you bring my little Gunter back. He's not little, Lisa, the innkeeper said. He's a straping young man. Still, I hope you bring my son back. I am old and I need him to chop the wood and show the horses and lift the kegs and... I am touched by your paternal concern, sir, Felix interrupted. He pulled his leather cap down on his head. Gotrek got up and looked at him. He beat his chest with one meaty hand. Armor is for women and girly elves, he said. Perhaps I had best veer it, Gotrek. If I am to return alive with the tales of your deeds, as I did, after all, swear to do. Yeah, you have a point, manling. And remember that it's not all you swore to do. He turned to the innkeeper. How will we find the dark stone ring? Felix felt his mouth go dry. He fought to keep his hands from shaking. There's a trail. It runs from the road. I will take you to its start. Good, Gotrek said. This is too good an opportunity to miss. Tonight I will atone for my sins and stand among the iron halls of my father's great groany willing. He made a peculiar sign over his chest with his clenched right hand. Come, manling, let us go. He strode out the door. Felix picked up his pack. As the doorway, the old woman stopped him and pressed something into his hand. Please, sir, she said. Take this. It is a charm to Sigma. It will protect you. My little Gunter wears its twin. And much good it's done him. Felix was about to say, but the expression on her face stopped him. It held fear, concern, and perhaps hope. He was touched. I will do my best, Frau. Outside, the sky was bright with the green witch light of the moons. Felix opened his hand. In it was a small iron hammer on a fine linked chain. He shrugged and hung it around his neck. Gottrek and the old man were already moving down the road. He had to run to catch up. What do you think these are, manling? Gotrek said, bending close to the ground. Ahead of them, the road continued on towards Harzenroch and Bogenhafen. Felix leaned on the leak marker. This was the edge of the trail. Felix hoped the innkeeper had returned home safely. Tracks, he said, going north. Very good, manling. They are coach tracks and they take the trail north to the Darkstone Ring. A black coach? Felix said. 
I hope so. What a glorious night. All my prayers are answered. A chance to atone and to get revenge on the swine who nearly ran me over. <laughs> Gotrek cackled gleefully, but Felix could sense a change in him. He seemed tense, as if suspecting that his hour of destiny were arriving and he would meet it badly. He seemed unusually talkative. A coach? Does this coven consist of noblemen, Manling? Is your empire so very corrupt? Felix shook his head. I don't know. It may have a noble leader. The members are most likely local folk. They say the taint of chaos runs deep in these out-of-the-way places. Gotrek shook his head for the first time ever he looked dismayed. I would weep for the folly of your people, Manling. To be corrupted that your rulers could sell themselves over to the powers of darkness, that is a terrible thing. Not all men are so, Felix said angrily. True, some seek easy power or the pleasures of the flesh, but they are few. Most people keep the faith. Anyway, the elder race are not so pure. I have heard tales of whole armies of dwarves dedicated to the ruinous powers. Gotrek gave a low, angry growl and spat on the ground. Felix grabbed the hilt of his sword tighter. He wondered whether he had pushed the troll slayer too far. You are correct, Gotrek said, his voice soft and cold. We do not likely talk about such things. We evoke eternal war against the abdominations you mentioned and their dark masters. As have my own people. We have our witch hunts and our laws. Gotrek shook his head. Your people do not understand. They are soft and decadent and live far from the war. They do not understand the terrible things which gnaw at the root of the world and seek to undermine us all. Witch hunts? Ha! He spat on the ground. Loss! There's only one way to meet the threat of chaos. He brandished his axe meaningfully. They trudged warily through the forest. Overhead the moons gleamed feverishly. More sleep had become ever brighter, and now its green glow stained the sky. A light mist had gathered, and the terrain they moved through was bleak and wild. Rocks broke through the turf like plage spots breaking through the skin of the world. Sometimes Felix thought he could hear great wings passing overhead, but when he looked up he could see only the glow in the sky. The mist distorted and spread so that it looked as though they walked along the bed of some infernal sea. There was a sense of wrongness about this place, Felix decided. The air tasted foul and the hair on the nape of his neck constantly prickled. Back when he had been a boy in Altdorf, he had sat in his father's house and watched the sky grow black with menacing clouds. Then had come the most monstrous storm in living memory. Now he felt the same sense of anticipation. Mighty forces were gathering close to here, he was certain. He felt like an insect crawling over the body of a giant that could at any moment wake and crush him. Even Gotrek seemed oppressed. He had fallen silent and did not even mumble to himself as he usually did. Now and again he would stop and motion for Felix to stand quiet. Then he would stand and sniff the air. Felix could see that his whole body tensed as if he strained with every nerve to catch the slightest trace of something. Then they would move on. Felix's muscles all felt tight with tension. He wished he had not come. Surely, he told himself, my obligation to the dwarf does not mean I must face certain death. Perhaps I can slip away in the mist. He gritted his teeth. He prided himself on being an honorable man, and the debt he owed the dwarf was real. The dwarf had risked his life to save him. Granted, at the time he had not known Godric was seeking death, curting it as a man curts a desirable lady, it still left him under an obligation. He remembered the riotous drunken evening in the taverns of the maze when they had sworn blood brothership in that curious dwarvish rite and he had agreed to help Gotrek in his quest. Gotrek wished his name remembered and his deeds recalled. When he had found out that Felix was a poet, the dwarf had asked Felix to accompany him. At the time, in the warm glow of beery comrades, 
It had seemed a splendid idea. The Troll Slayer's doomed quest struck Felix as excellent material for an epic poem, one that would make him famous. Little did I know, Felix thought, that it would lead to this, hunting for monsters on Geheimnisnacht. He smiled ironically. It was easy to sing of brave deeds in the tavern and play halls where horror was a thing conjured by the words of skilled craftsmen. Out here, though, it was different. His bowels felt loose with fear, and the oppressive atmosphere made him want to run screaming. Still, he tried to console himself. This is fit subject matter for a poem, if only I live to write it. The woods became deeper and more tangled. The trees took on the aspect of twisted, uncanny beings. Felix felt as if they were watching him. He tried to dismiss the thought as fantasy, but... The mist and the ghastly moonlight only stimulated his imagination. He felt as if every pool of shadow contained a monster. Felix looked down at the dwarf. Gotrek's face held a mixture of anticipation and fear. Felix had thought him immune to terror, but now he realized it was not so. A ferocious will drove him to seek his doom. Feeling that his own death might be near at hand, Felix asked a question that he had long been afraid to utter. A uh, troll slayer, what was it you did that you must atone for? What crime drives you to punish yourself so? Gotrek looked up at him and turned his face to gaze off into the night. Felix watched the cable-like muscles of his neck ripple like serpents as he did so. If another man asked me that question, I would slaughter him. I make allowances for your use and ignorance and the friendship right we have undergone. Such a death would make me a kinslayer. That is a terrible crime. Such crimes we do not talk about. Felix had not realized the dwarf was so attached to him. Gotrek looked up at him as if respecting a response. I understand, Felix said. Do you, manling? Do you really? The troll slayer's voice was as harsh as stones breaking. Felix smiled ruefully. In that moment he saw the gap that separated man from dwarf. He would never understand the strange taboos, their obsessions with oath and order and pride. He could not see what would drive the troll slayer to carry out his self-imposed death sentence. Your people are too harsh with themselves, he said. Yours are too soft. The troll slayer replied. They fell into silence. Both were startled by a quiet, mad laugh. Felix turned, whipping up his blade into the guard position. Gotrek raised his axe. Out of the mists something shambled. Once it had been a man, Felix decided. The outline was still there. It was as if some mad god held the creature close to a demonic fire until flesh dripped and ran and had left it to set in a new and abhorrent form. This night we will dance! It said in a high-pitched voice that held no hint of sanity. Dance and touch! <laughs> it reached out gently to Felix and stroked his arm. Felix recoiled in horror as fingers like clumps of maggots rose towards his face. This night at the stone we will dance and touch and rub. It made as if to embrace him. It smiled, showing short pointed teeth. Felix stood quietly. He felt like a spectator, distant from the event that was happening. He pulled back and put the point of his sword against the thing's chest. Come no closer, Felix warned. The thing smiled. Its mouth seemed to grow wider. It showed more small, sharp teeth. Its lips rolled back till the bottom half of his face seemed all wet, glistening gum, and the jaw sank lower like that of a snake. It pushed forward against the sword till beads of blood glistened on its chest. It gave a gurgling, idiotic laugh. <laughs> and touch and rub and eat, it said, and with inhuman swiftness, it wrist around the sword and leapt for Felix. Swift as it was, the troll slayer was swifter. In mid-leap his axe caught its neck. 
The head rolled into the night. A red fountain gushed. This is not happening, thought Felix. What was that? A demon? Gottrek asked. Felix could hear the excitement in his voice. I think it once was a man, Felix said. One of the tainted ones marked by chaos. They are abandoned at birth. That one spoke your tongue. Sometimes the taint does not show till they are older. Relatives think they are sick and protect them till they make their way to the woods and vanish. Their kin protect such abdominations? It happens. We don't talk about it. It's hard to turn your back on people you love, even if they change. The dwarf stared at him in disbelief, then shook his head. Too soft, he said. Too soft. The air was still. Sometimes Felix thought he sensed presences moving in the trees, about him and froze nervously, peering into the mist, searching for moving shadows. The encounter with the tainted one had brought home to him the danger of the situation. He felt with him a great fear and a great anger. Part of the anger was directed at himself for feeling the fear. He was sick and ashamed. He decided that whatever happened, he would not repeat his error, standing like a sheep to be slaughtered. What was that? Gottrek asked. Felix looked at him. Can't you hear it, manling? Listen. It sounds like chanting. Felix strained to catch the sound, but heard nothing. We are close now, very close. They pushed on in silence. As they trudged through the mist, Gotrek became ever more cautious and left the trail, using the long grass for cover. Felix joined him. Now he could hear the chanting. It sounded as though it was coming from scores of throats. Some of the voices were human, others were deep and bestial. There were male voices and female voices. Mingled with the slow beat of a drum, the clash of cymbals and discordant piping. Felix would make out one word only, repeated over and over until it was driven into his consciousness. The word was... Slanish. Felix shuddered. Slanish, the dark lord of unspeakable pleasures. It was a name that conjured up the worst depths of depravity. It was whispered in the drug dens and vice houses of Altdorf by those so jaded that they sought pleasures beyond human understanding. It was a name associated with corruption and excess and the dark underbelly of imperial society. For those who followed Slanesh, no stimulation was too bizarre, no pleasure forbidden. The mist covers us, Felix whispered to the troll slayer. Shh, shh, be quiet. We must get closer. They crept forward slowly. The long wet grass dragged at Felix's body and soon he was damp. Ahead he could see the beacons burning in the dark. The scent of blazing wood and cloying sickly sweet incense filled the air. He looked around hoping that no latecomer would blunder into them. He felt absurdly exposed. Inch by inch they advanced. Gottrek dragged his battle axe along behind him, and once Felix touched its sharp blade with his fingers, he cut himself and fought back a desire to scream out. They reached the edge of the long grass and found themselves staring at a crude ring of six obscenely shaped stones, amid which stood a monolithic slab. The stones glowed greenly with the light of some luminous fungus. On top of each was a brazier, which gave off clouds of smoke. Beams of pallid green moonlight illuminated a hellish scene. Within the ring danced six humans, masked and garbled in long cloaks. The cloaks were thrown back over one shoulder, revealing naked bodies, both male and female. On one hand the revelers each wore finger symbols, which they clashed, in the other they carried switches of birch, with which they each lashed the dancer in front. Yaktuk tu amat slanish! Yaktuk tu amat slanish! They cried. Felix could see that some of the bodies were marked by bruises. The dancers seemed to feel no pain. 
Perhaps it was a narcotic effect of the incense. Around the stone ring lolled figures of horror. The drummer was a huge man with the head of a stag and cloven hooves. Near him sat a piper with the head of a dog and hands with suckered fingers. A large crowd of tainted women and men withered in the ground nearby. Some of their bodies were subtly distorted. Men who were tall with thin pinheads, short, fat women with three eyes and three breasts. Others were barely recognizable as ones having been human. They were scale-covered man-serpents and wolf-headed furred beasts mingling with the things that were all teeth and mouth and other orifices. Felix could barely breathe. He watched the entire proceeding with mounting fear. Drums beat faster now. The rhythmic chanting increased in pace. The piping became ever louder and more discordant as the dancers became more frenzied, lashing themselves and their companions until bloody wheels became visible. Then there was the clash of cymbals and all fell silent. Felix thought they had been spotted and he froze. The smoke of the incense filled his nostrils and seemed to amplify all his senses. He felt even more remote and disconnected from reality. There was a sharp, stabbing pain in his side. He was startled to realize that Gotrek had elbowed him in the ribs. He was pointing to something beyond the stone ring. Felix struggled to see what loomed in the mist. Then he realized it was a black coach. In the sudden, shocking silence, he heard its door swing open. He held his breath and waited to see what would emerge. A figure seemed to take shape out of the mist. It was tall and masked and garbled in layered cloaks of many pastel colors. It moved with calm authority and its arms carried something swaddled in brocade cloth. Felix looked at Gotrek, but he was watching the unfolding scene with fanatical intensity. Felix wondered if the dwarf had lost his nerve at this late hour. The newcomer stepped forward into the stone circle. Amaku tu amatslanish! It cried, rising its bundle on high. Felix could see that it was a child, though whether living or dead, he could not tell. Yagruk tu amatslanish! Tatskol tin amatslanish! The crowd responded ecstatically. The cloaked man started out at the surrounding faces, and it seemed to Felix that the stranger gazed straight at him with calm brown eyes. He wondered if the coven master knew they were there and was playing with them. Amakju Slanish! The man cried in a clear voice. Amaklesa! Amakslanish! Amaklesa! Amakslanish! responded the crowd. It was clear to Felix that some evil ritual had begun. As the ride progressed, the coven master moved closer to the altar with slow ceremonial steps. Felix felt his mouth go dry. He licked his lips. Gotrek watched the events as if hypnotized. The child was placed on the altar with a thunderous rumble of drum beats. Now the six dancers each stood beside a pillar, legs astride it, clutching at the stone suggestively. As the ritual progressed, they ground themselves against the pillars with slow, sinuous movements. From within his robes, the master produced a long, weavy bladed knife. Felix wondered whether the dwarf was going to do something. He could hardly bear to watch. Slowly, the knife was raised, high over the cultist's heads. Felix forced himself to look. An ominous presence hovered over the scene. Mist and incense seemed to be clotting together and congealing, and within the cloud, Felix thought he could make out a grotesque form writhe and begin to materialize. Felix could bear the tension no longer. No! he shouted. He and the troll slayer emerged from the long grass and marched shoulder to shoulder towards the stone ring. At first, the cultists didn't seem to notice them. But finally, the demented drumming stopped and the chanting faded and the cult master turned to glare at them, astonished. For a moment, everyone stared. No one seemed to understand what was happening. Then the cult master pointed the knife at them and screamed, Kill the interlopers! The revelers moved forward in a wave. 
Felix felt something tug at his leg and then the sharp pain. When he looked down, he saw a creature, half woman, half serpent, gnawing at his ankle. He kicked out, pulling his legs free and stepped down with his sword. A shock passed up his arm as the blade hit bone. He began to run, following in the wake of Gotrek, who was hacking his way towards the altar. The mighty double-bladed axe rose and fell rhythmically and left a trail of red ruin in its path. The cultists seemed drugged and slow to respond, but horrifyingly they showed no fear. Man and woman, tainted and untainted, threw themselves towards the intruders with no thought for their own lives. Felix hacked and stabbed at anyone who came close. He put his blade under the ribs and into the heart of a dog-faced man who leapt at him. As he tried to tuck his blade free, a woman with claws and a man with mucus-covered skin leapt on him. The white bore him over, knocking the wind from him. He felt the woman's talons scratch at his face as he put his foot under her stomach and kicked her off. Blood rolled down into his eye from the cuts. The man had fallen badly, but leapt to grab her throat. Felix fumbled for his dagger with his left hand while he caught the man's throat with his right. The man writhed. It was difficult to grip because of his coating of slime. His own hands tightened inexorably on Felix's throat in return, and he wrapped himself against Felix, panting with pleasure. Blackness started to overcome the poet. Little sliver points flared before his eyes. He felt an overwhelming urge to relax and fall forward into the darkness. Somewhere far away, he heard Gotrek's bellowed war cry. With an effort of will, Felix jerked his dagger clear of its scabbard, and plunged it into his assailant's ribs. The creature stiffened and grinned, revealing rows of eel-like teeth. He gave an ecstatic moan even as he died. Slanish, take me! The man shrieked. Ah, the pain, the lovely pain! Felix pulled himself to his feet just as a clawed woman rose to hers. He lashed out with his boot, connected with her jaw. There was a crunch and she fell backwards. Felix shook his head to clear the blood from his eye. The majority of the cultists had concentrated on Gotrek. This had kept Felix alive. The dwarf was trying to hack his way towards the heart of the stone circle. Even as he moved, the press of bodies against him slowed him down. Felix could see that he bled from dozens of small cuts. The ferocious energy of the dwarf was terrible to see. He froze at the mouth and ranted as he chopped, sending limbs and heads everywhere. He was covered in a filthy matting of gore, but in spite of his sheer ferocity, Felix could tell the fight was going against Gotrek. Even as he watched, a cloaked reveler hit the dwarf with a club and Gotrek went down under a wave of bodies. So he has met his doom, Felix thought, just as he desired. Beyond the ruck, of the melee, the cold master had regained his composure. Once more he began to chant and raise the dagger on high. The terrible shape that had been forming from the mist seemed once again to coalesce. Felix had a premonition that, if it took on full substance, they were doomed. He could not fight his way through the bodies that surrounded the troll slayer. For a long moment he watched the curved bladed knife reflecting the more sleep light. Then he threw back his own dagger. Sigma, guide my hand. He prayed and threw. The blade flew straight and true to the throat of the high priest, hitting beneath the mask where flesh was exposed. With a gurgle, the cult master toppled backwards. A long whine of frustration filled the air, and the mist seemed to evaporate. The shape within the mist vanished. As one, the cultist looked up in shock. The tainted ones turned to stare at him. Felix found himself confronted by the mad glare of dozens of unfriendly eyes. He stood immobile and very, very afraid. The silence was deathly. Then there was an almighty war and Gotrek emerged from it midst a pile of bodies, pummeling about him with hammer-sized fists. He reached down and from somewhere retrieved his axe. He shortened his grip on the haft and laid about him with its shaft. Felix scooped up his own sword and ran to join him. They fought through the crush until they were back to back. The cultists, filled with fear of the loss of their leader, began to flee into the night and mist. 
Soon, Felix and Gotrek stood alone under the shadows of the dark stone ring. Gotrek looked at Felix balefully, blood clotting in his crested hair. In the witch light, he looked demonic. I'm robbed of a mighty death, manling. He raised his axe meaninglessly. Felix wondered if he was still berserk and about to chop him down in spite of the binding oath. Gotrek began to advance slowly towards him. Then the dwarf grinned. It would seem the gods preserved me for a greater doom yet. He planted his axe, hilt first into the ground and began to laugh till the tears ran down his face. <laughs> Having exhausted his laughter, he turned to the altar and picked up the infant. It lives, he said. Felix began to inspect the corpses of the cloaked cultists. He unmasked them. The first one was a blonde-haired girl covered in wheels and bruises. The second was a young man. He had an amulet in the shape of a hammer hanging almost mockingly around his neck. I don't think we will be going back to the inn, Felix said sadly. One local tale tells of an infant found on the steps of a temple of Shalia in Hatzoch. It was wrapped in a blood-soaked cloak of sunland wool, a pouch of gold lay nearby, and a steel amulet in the shape of a hammer was around its neck. The priestess swore she saw a black coach thundering away in the dawnlight. The natives of Harzenroch tell another and darker tale of how Ingrid Hauptmann and Gunther, the innkeeper's son, were slain in some horrific sacrifice to the dark powers. The road wardens who found the corpses up by the dark stone ring agreed it must have been a terrible ride. The bodies looked as if they had been chopped up with an axe wielded by a demon.